why are we losing freedom? Why is freedom on the wane? Why is totalitarianism and tyranny rising up? Why do we see so much control and obsession with control in our society? You know, they'll see that. Many of them will see the rising police state. They'll see the injustices in our society. They'll see the restrictions on our, our inherent natural liberty. Okay? But here's the thing. Many of them will not make the transition to grasping. You know? They'll say, yeah, this is what's happening to the earth. It's being turned into a huge prison everywhere. And at the most rapid pace right here in America. Okay? And they'll see this lock going onto the cage. But the question that they never get to, they don't even get to the question, let alone the answer, is why? They'll talk about the symptoms. They'll describe the prison. They'll describe every corner of the cage accurately in many cases. They can tell you exactly how it's working. They can tell you all the different aspects of the control system. But they can't tell you why it's actually going into place. Why is that happening? Well, that's what this presentation answers. Why are we losing freedom? And it gets to the actual heart of that answer. So what this presentation constitutes is a master key that unlocks all the locks to all the doors on all the cages in the prison, if it is accepted. And once again, I don't tell you that belief is required for that, because truth is always present. It's always here. It's a matter of will we perceive it as being present, acknowledge it's present, by stop ignoring it, okay, and then accept it into ourselves, and then do something with it. Understanding is not the end. Taking in the knowledge and understanding it is the beginning. Action is required. See, knowledge is required, understanding is required, but then action is finally required, above all, if change is to be created. And that's how the laws of attraction really work. So, will people as a whole, as a society, accept that master key? I can't answer that question. All I could do is try to place it into their hands. After I have taken that key and unlocked my personal prison, my personal cages, and freed my mind, all I can do is try to help people to see, here's how this key works. Here it is. Here's the information that constitutes that key. And here's how you put it to work in your life. That's all I can do. Can't make anybody take it. Let's look at what problem solving entails, because that's really critical to understand if we're going to get past the, this stage and where we're at in our stifled uh, evolutionary development as a species. There's a few main steps to solving problems, any problem. doesn't matter what the nature of the problem is. The first is you have to recognize that the problem exists. Recognize that there is a problem to begin with. And I think by asking the question, is everybody content with the way things are, and nobody raised their hand, I think that's great because it, it at least acknowledges to me the people here today recognize we have a problem. And that's healthy. That's good. Okay? Many people out there don't believe we have a problem. You know, they, they, they like this place. They like the world the way that it is. You know, which is unfathomable to me because to me it's a living hell. And that's not because of how my own personal life is going. I'm very content with my own personal life. I have no self-inflicted suffering in my personal life. I don't create problems for myself. My life goes on very well according to how I live it without hurting anybody else. The problem is other people. And that's another thing new, the New Agers won't acknowledge. And they'll flip out if you say that there's a problem with someone else. There are problems with other people. Okay? And people will say people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. My glass house has been taken down long since, long time ago, because I went through all that personal introspective work. And I dug deep into my subconscious and faced those problems and confronted them head on and healed them and came out of the mindset that I was once in. Okay? So, you know, people will say, if there's something you don't like, you're seeing in, in other people, that's something in yourself that you're seeing in them. This, this is new age mumbo jumbo nonsense. 
okay? If you're not part of the problem, I'm not part of this problem. I can say that honestly. I'm not part of this problem. I can look at every single person, anybody who's watching this, and say, I'm not part of the problem that's happening on the earth. With all honesty and knowing that I am telling the truth with that. Okay? But, but see, at one point, I was part of the problem. And a, a big part of the problem. Okay? What I had to do at some point is stop doing this and pointing out and saying the problem lies elsewhere while I was still part of it. And then I had to do this and point squarely at myself and say, what do I need to change here, here, and finally here in the guts, in the courage? You know, people will say, yeah, change happens in the mind, it happens in the heart, but lastly, it happens in the guts. We need to generate what I call the heart, mind, guts, okay? You got to care enough to know and then put it into action. The heart, mind, guts, okay? That taking action is the most important step when it comes to creating change. We're going to get to that in a moment. But the whole point here is I had to look at what I needed to change about myself in my thoughts, my emotions, and my actions, and then change those things in myself. This is what most people want to run away from. They want to say, yeah, I want those things that I say I want to magically to be present in my life, but I don't want to do those things that require self-change in how I think, in how I feel, and in how I act. I want it magically to happen without changing those things in me. So I can honestly look at the rest of the world and say, the problem does not lie within me. I am not seeing a manifestation of myself in other people. Other people have not done the same process that I have the introspective work that I have, and gone through that painful, painstaking work that involves effort, hard effort. I'm not up here telling people, I'm offering you the, the tonic. You're going to take a sip and magically you will be enlightened. Okay? Knowing what's going on in the world is hard work. It involves destruction. It's a destructive process. It involves destruction of belief systems. It involves completely breaking down barriers that are in your head. Okay? Hardly anybody wants to do that work. People want to run a million miles an hour in the opposite direction from that work. Anything but that. I'll take the grave instead of that. Okay? That's where most people's heads are at. Alright? So let's get back to the steps here for problem solving. The first is, you got to recognize that there's a problem. If you are in denial, good luck. Let me know how that works out for you. Because you're not solving any problem in a state of denial at all. Fear-based denial of the problem must first be dealt with and conquered and stamped out. And you have to acknowledge how bad it is. You know, people feel symptoms coming on of a disease or something and they want to ignore it because they don't want to believe I'm sick. I don't want to believe I'm sick. I don't want to believe I have a problem. Then you're waiting, waiting, waiting. You don't get it diagnosed. And then it turns into a much bigger problem, which is where we're at as a society for ignoring this information. This is what denial looks like, symbolically. Okay? A person with their head in the sand like an ostrich. And please take note, ladies and gentlemen, when you're in this position, when you're in the position of denial with your head in the sand, you're on your knees with your ass in the air. Okay? And I, I almost say it's amazingly synchronistic that the human body was designed like that. That in order to put your head in the sand, symbolically so to speak, you have to be on your knees. Okay? And that's where most of our society is at. They're on their knees. And in that state of denial. The second step to problem solving is to recognize that the symptoms that are being displayed, the symptoms you are seeing, are merely effects of underlying causal factors. You can't treat symptoms and solve a problem. It's not possible. That's not how problem solving works. You have to get to what caused the problem. Okay? Instead of simply treating symptoms, make an accurate diagnosis of the causes of the problem. So what does the word diagnosis mean? 
diagnosis comes from Greek. The preposition dia, transliterated there, there in the parentheses, you see it in, in Greek script, okay? It means through or by way of. So by a method, by a particular method, all right? And the second part of diagnosis is the Greek noun gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge in Greek. So what a diagnosis means is through knowledge or by way of knowledge. You're going to solve the problem by way of knowledge. There is knowledge that acts as the requirement to solving the problem and getting what you want. And here's another thing, and I'm going to keep going back to this. It's going to be like an undercurrent in this. Because the New Age community, and I'm going to be, I'm, have been, but I'm going to become a more outspoken opponent of New Age ideologies because they are lying to people, whether it be through direct, willful deception or whether it be through useful dupes and useful idiots. They are telling people things that are completely inaccurate to how things really work, all right? Because they want to keep people suppressed and non-active. They want people in acceptance mode of everything. Accept, 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 never rebel. Okay? Don't take action. Just observe. Just watch. You'll hear all of these things in the New Age movement. Okay? The reason I bring it up is because when you even say the word knowledge to some New Agers, they almost take offense. Because what's, what the New Age is becoming is the new modern day variant. It's a new form of what's known as solipsism. And we're going to get to what solipsism is in a little while. Okay, But essentially, people don't want to hear that knowledge is what is required. Because the attainment of real knowledge, not pseudo-knowledge, real knowledge, requires work. It requires effort. It requires reading. It requires listening. It requires watching. And you know what most of all it requires that people don't want to give up? Who can tell me? Time. Thank you, sir. It requires time. There's one of the currencies people don't spend, uh, you know, on many things that they don't feel they can get immediate gratification from, which is why immediate gratification is so stressed in our society by the control system. That's what keeps people in their ignorance. So a diagnosis means if you're going to get well, you've got to have the knowledge of the underlying causal factors that, that led to the creation of the symptoms. You're not going to treat the symptoms and get well. you got to have the knowledge to get to the causal factors to find out what cause put this into effect. And we're going to talk a lot about cause and effect. The third step to problem solving is through the knowledge that you've acquired now, via making an accurate diagnosis of the problem of the causal factors, right? You're going to then put that knowledge into action. Understanding what created the problem is like step two, right? Stop being in denial. Understand what caused the problem. Act on the knowledge you now have to solve the problem, to make it right, okay? So action is required, we make the diagnosis, then we have to take the required action necessary to rectify or to set right, which is what the word rectify means, the causal factors that led to the manifestation of the problem. Let's talk a little bit about the concept of what truth is, how I refer to truth in all of my work. Because people have a real deeply mystified concept of what truth is or what it means, you know? They'll get into all these really deep abstract discussions of uh, the mind of God and, you know, uh, trying to get into like, you know, quantum theory and everything. Th this is mystification of the concept of the truth. And we have to demystify it. We have to bring it down to real simple, easy to understand language that anybody can comprehend and then really completely delineate that from perception of any given thing. Because the two are not the same. When people say perception is reality, nothing could be farther from reality than that statement. Perception is not reality. 
Okay? It is just what it says, perception. Seeing through, perceive, to see through something. Like a lens or a filter. Okay? I perceive things differently without these glasses. That's one perception. When I put them on, I perceive things quite differently and more clearly. Okay? Well, that's how human perception works, like a lens. It's a filter. Okay? But what's there is the same thing. What's there is the same thing. All the change is how I perceived it. All right? So let's look at this concept. Truth is objective. That means that it's not dependent upon the perceptions of human beings. No one wants to hear that. That is, that is a direct assault, a direct frontal assault on the human ego. Because everybody wants to hear, my perceptions are important. And we want to also believe my perceptions are accurate. Okay? Now people will say, well, what makes you say your perception of this topic is going to be accurate? That's because I went through the process of having to admit over and over and over and over and over again endlessly how wrong I was about my former perceptions. I went through that destructive process of breaking down my former belief systems, of breaking down my former emotional patterns, of, uh, and of, of most of all changing my behavior. That's the thing that's the most destructive because we get attached to our behaviors and patterns. So asking people to change, I recognize it's not easy. It took me like probably, probably about eight years of my life to do it. Most people don't want to spend a minute on creating personal change, let alone eight years. And you know, when I look at myself in all honesty, again, none of this is to sound egoic or to toot my own horn, but I look at it like I was a mild case of ego entrapment. A mild case compared to where I see other people at. I, I, I feel like I was the, uh, uh, you know, a very brittle stone that just needed to be hit with a chisel a few times and it broke into powder. You know, other people are hardened granite or diamond. You know, to break them down is going to take enormous effort and work. And most of them don't even want to do it. They're so calcified. You know, they're so, they've been so compressed into that hardened state that they don't even want to start. So I realize telling people your perceptions are not what really matters. You know, that the truth isn't based upon how you perceive things, that it's independent from your perceptions. Most people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. Human beings' perceptions are capable of wavering. They can, they can waver slightly from the truth, and they can waver wildly from the truth. All right? Okay, so we ended uh, before the dinner break. I hope everyone enjoyed their dinner. At um, uh, the concept that if there is no victim, if no actual wrongdoing has taken place, resulting in harm to someone else, there is no crime. And many people are you know, being jailed for victimless crimes that they've actually never actually... Uh, harmed another being and yet their freedom has been taken away. Another aspect about this uh, concept of the difference between right and wrong behavior is we have to understand that there is no such thing as the ability to delegate a wrong to someone else. No one can say to someone, you may harm him on a, unchallenged or unaccosted, okay? That you're allowed to do that morally. Okay, no more than anybody can say a group of people may commit a wrongdoing and they have the moral right to commit it, to commit that wrongdoing. There's no such thing as that. Okay, so this is what many people who believe in things like government believe in, that we can delegate to a group of people who are calling themselves a government something that is not a right and agree, all come together and agree upon, they now possess this right. Rights can't be granted by human beings to other human beings. Everybody is born with the same rights because rights don't come from human beings. Rights, like the laws of nature, come from the creator of the universe. They don't come from human beings. Human beings don't make up what right and wrong are. Right and wrong are inherent to creation and are up to us to discover and recognize what they are and then live in accordance with those principles. So if 
a specific action is not a right for any individual. That action cannot be, quote, delegated, granted, or licensed to any un other individual or group and magically called a right. It does not become a right. If it's wrong, it, stay it remains a wrong, no matter how many people believe they can do it or delegate it or otherwise. Similarly, a right can't be turned into a wrong. If it's a right and you're not harming somebody by doing it, somebody can't magically say, well, that's a wrong and you're not allowed to do that. And yet we have things that go right hand in hand with that, and it's called government. Uh, an action that is a wrong would forever remain a wrong under natural law. So how do we know what rights are? Um, part of knowing rights is understand that natural law, the difference between right and wrong, always holds true regardless of a population's belief system. Like natural law being in effect, the difference between right and wrong are not dependent on anybody's belief. They are eternal truths that need to be understood. So this means it does not matter how many people agree that a wrong can be turned into a right or that a right can be turned into a wrong. Such things can never be done in reality. We can believe we can do that and act like that, but in reality it cannot actually be done. A right forever remains a right, a wrong forever remains a wrong. People can only believe that they can claim such reversals and that this will magically make it so. Unfortunately, most human beings erroneously believe that it is morally possible for them to create and delegate rights, quote unquote, which do not exist, or to take away actual rights from people which do exist. They believe we can do that. So when in doubt as to whether an action is or is not in harmony with natural law, the visualization exercise that I always ask people to do is to imagine a scenario of a planet, a world, where there is only two people, where only two people exist on, a, on an entire planet, okay? If the behavior in that circumstance, in that visualized instance, is either a right or a wrong in that instance, it remains a right or a wrong in any size population, regardless of how many people may believe otherwise. Okay, so if a right is a right for one person to do toward another, okay, or if it's a wrong, the action is a wrong for one person to take toward another, population is irrelevant. People will say, well, yeah, if there was a couple of people, that would be okay, but if in a world of seven billion people, we can't let people do that. Well, this has nothing to do with what right and wrong is, you know, as if they're changeable. Let's, um, let's look at this scenario. So there's our world, and there's two people, okay? two well-groomed businessmen. <laughs> and they're, you know, we're going to look at it at an instance. Uh, let's look at taxation, the concept of taxation. Is taxation of any kind a right or a wrong? Is it morally acceptable and justifiable, or is it something that is actually a wrong? So let's look at what taxation really is. And again, we're not going to euphemize. We're going to talk about it straight on. So here's what taxation is. It's not what I believe it is. I'm getting down to the heart of the matter and describing what it actually is. Taxation is the claim that a specific group of people who call themselves government have been given a, quote, right. They've been delegated a right, okay? We've written down a law, and we say the, this people calling themselves the government and the IRS have a right to do this particular action, this activity, okay, this behavior. They've been given a right to confiscate, uh, unwillingly, I might add, an arbitrarily chosen percentage of the product of another individual's labor. Now, let me just start with this, right? If you ask anybody, how many are you going to voluntarily pay more taxes? Nobody will raise their hand. And you say, why not? Well, because I could barely afford to pay the ones I'm paying now, and I don't want to volunteer any more money toward that endeavor. Quite frankly, I want my resources for myself to use as I see fit voluntarily. But if the government then said, well, your taxes are going up by 5%, how many people would pay them? Most people would. Because subconsciously or, or consciously, they recognize this is, they're under coercion. They're actually under duress. They're being told that if they don't give this at the command of the people who are confiscating it, that some for, 
form of violence will be conducted upon them, whether through the form of fining them and saying we're going to take more of your resources, whether by saying we're going to throw you in a cage and make you stay there for as long as we say you need to stay there, okay? Uh, or by actually conducting actual physical harm upon them. So, again, it's we're saying that this quote-unquote right is given to individuals who call themselves government, and then they have the right to confiscate this arbitrarily chosen percentage of the product of another individual's labor. Because that's what money is, okay? Or that that's what, you know, whatever we make through what we, we work, that's the product of our labor. We work and then we get compensated for it. So that's an exchange for labor that we have done. That's our property, because we gave labor in return for that. So this is done whether or not the other agrees to share that product voluntarily. It's not a voluntary process. Coercion is involved. Taxation is enforced by the threat of violence, which is behavior that will result in bodily harm, or imprisonment, which is the taking away of physical freedom of movement. If those from whom the product is being seized attempt to resist this confiscation. This practice is always, quote, justified, and the word justify actually breaks down etymologically. It, it means, the word justify means to create a right. That's what justify actually means. Jus in Latin means right or law, and then uh, faceo, facere means to create or to make. So to justify means to create right, to make a right up and conjure it into existence. So it's always justified or made into a right, quote unquote, by those who claim that such a practice is necessary and required to, quote unquote, uphold the common good. This is the justification offered for the seizure of the product of people's labor involuntarily. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, if we define the concept of slavery, and I think this is a good definition for slavery, would it be fair to say slavery is the involuntary confiscation of 100% of the product of the labor of another human being? Would that be a fair definition? You're saying you're working, I'm going to take whatever you generate as a result of that work that you're doing. It doesn't belong to you. The product of your labor doesn't belong to you. All of it belongs to me. So you work for me. I take everything that you have been able to amass or create through the labor that you have done. I think everybody here would agree that's slavery. That's as good as a definition of slavery as you're probably going to get. I mean, we can come up with some other definitions that involve coercion and physically shackling and keeping people. But if we really are honest with ourselves, what is the purpose of slavery to begin with is to make others work for free and then take all of the product of the labor. That's what slavery was conducted for. Okay? So, if we're defining slavery as the involuntary confiscation of 100% of the product of the labor of another human being, we should be able to clearly see that there is no magical percentage to which we could lower this number that would no longer make it slavery. So I ask people, if if the person who's saying I'm going to confiscate 100% of your labor and keep it for myself would say, well, I'm going to take 75%. I'll take three quarters. You can keep a quarter of what you've created. Would that no longer constitute slavery? And I don't care what you say I'm going to use the 75% for, okay? If you're telling somebody you have no choice, 75% of your labor belongs to me, would that no longer be slavery just because they allow them to keep 25? Okay, let's lower it to 50. Is it still slavery? Okay. Well, what percentage could it possibly be lowered to for it not to be slavery anymore? Only zero. There is no percentage that it could be lowered to for it not to constitute slavery. And again, if we're being honest with ourselves, many people want to justify this in many ways by saying, oh, it's used for services, services which someone doesn't have a right to refuse. You know, I tell people, hey, if I said to you, I'm a computer technician, you own a computer? Okay, I'm now your computer technician, you're not allowed to refuse my services. Think, just think about that for a moment. You may not refuse that I am now providing the service for your computer to keep it in, in good shape. Okay? First of all, what have I just taken from that gentleman? Right to choose. Right to choose. Free will. 
Right there, that's slavery. I don't even have to keep going and say, hey, if you refuse or, you know, if you, whether you want or don't want my computer services, I'm now your technician. And I need uh, $200 every year. Uh, I'll come over a couple of times. I don't care whether you're happy with my service or not. Okay? And if you don't pay me, I'm coming and taking the computer. Now, is that your, really your property if, if you're living under that kind of duress? Or am I just a violent criminal who's saying, I'm going to steal your stuff if you don't give me what I say? I'm holding you under extortion. That's duress. That's called duress. It means I am threatening violence unto the person unless they conform to my will. And that's what we're all held under. We're held under duress. All forms of tax taxation are duress. It is a master class telling people you have no right to refuse the arbitrarily set confiscation of your labor that I, I deem is going to be necessary for what I say it's necessary for. So how could you possibly claim that your home belongs to you if you're paying something called a property tax? That somebody is saying, for the services we provide in this community, you must pay us this percentage, and if you don't pay it, your house is, is going to be turned over to, to the government. And it's, you know what that's called? There's a term for that, okay? When, when a, a society doesn't actually have true private property ownership rights and a higher class of, of, you know, masters actually owns the land and owns the property and only allows the, the, the peasant class to live upon the property for as long as they pay tribute to the master class, who can tell me what system of government that is? That's called feudalism. And that's the, that's the United States government and just about every government on the earth. You live in feudalism. There's no such thing as democracy. There's certainly not a constitutional republic, that's for sure. Okay? The state of, the de facto state of government, which means indeed in action, is feudalism. So how about licenses and permits? These are claims that a group of people who call themselves government and again, we're going back and visualizing. Imagine one person trying to make this claim to another person. Nobody would find it legitimate. Nobody would find that one person may make that claim to another person. Yet we think these other people called government have rights that individuals don't have. That's what we think. That's called mind control. Mind control is getting people to accept some people have rights that other people don't have. That's what it is. You know? So go back to that visualization exercise. Can one person make that claim over another and have it be legitimate? Of course not. So if nobody has that right, how could that right be delegated to somebody else? It can't. Licenses and permits, they're claims that a group of people who call themselves government have been given the right, quote unquote, the right to prevent others from exercising specific behaviors even if such behaviors cause no harm to others or their property. Unless those others petition, meaning beg, or pay the government for permission. That's what a permit is. It means permission to be allowed to exercise those behaviors. This amounts to the claim that the, that rights are actually merely privileges that may be granted or revoked by government at any time. Okay? Based upon the people in government's preference, their discretion. All right? Remembering that the definition of a right is any action which does not cause harm to another living being or their property. There is no such thing as the right, quote unquote, to stop another person from exercising a right. If, if, if something is a right, meaning it doesn't cause harm, there is no such thing as someone's right to stop you from performing that action. Okay? That would be called coercion, which is a wrong. Okay? So, the actual ingest, ingestion of, let's say, marijuana, for example, harms no one else. You can put that into your body, sit there perfectly peacefully, and not cause harm to another living being. That's called a right for the very specific definition that it caused no harm. Okay? I would not have the right to tell another individual, you may not do that action. That would be a wrongdoing. Well, it's the same thing for, for something 
when it comes to licenses and permits. You're telling people, hey, if you pay me $50, I'll let you smoke that marijuana without doing violence to you. Unless I change my mind. And then I won't, I won't give you a permit. I'll just say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Even something that is a right, like assembling and speaking. Like what was done in the state of Pennsylvania a few years ago when the G20 visited it in the city of Pittsburgh. Okay? The city telling people, we have revoked the right to assemble and speak and petition for grievances. You don't have the right to come and speak. No protests will be tolerated or we'll hit you with sound and water cannons. You know? And people just laid down and, and accepted it. The whole city of Pittsburgh. You know? Because, oh, we're going to go and ask them for a permit. And they just said no. Nope. You don't have that right anymore. We find you on the street. You're getting blasted with a sound cannon and deafened. Some people are, went permanently deaf. Permanently deaf. Lost their hearing from what happened in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Force versus violence. We need to understand that these concepts are complete opposites of each other. They are not the same. The terms should never be used interchangeably with, with each other because not only are they not even remotely similar, they're direct, diametrically opposed opposites. Let's look at the difference. They're often spoken about as if they're the same and they're used interchangeably when in fact they are actually diametrically opposed to each other. Force, the definition of force, is the capacity to do work or cause physical change in the physical world. Okay, For any change to be created in the physical world in any capacity, force must be used and applied. There's nothing you can do that doesn't require force if you're going to make a change happen in the physical. Okay? So, to set up this equipment, force was required. We had to lift it, we had to set it up, we had to plug in the cables. Force is required to do all those things. It's the capacity to perform physical activity, physical work. Okay? Action, force is actually action with which is in harmony with morality and natural law because the taking of it, the usage of it, doesn't violate rights of other people. So as soon as you're stepping over the line into coercive usage of force, that becomes violence. The initiation of force for coercive reasons, for coercive applications, becomes violence. That's what makes it violence. Force itself is not violence. As such, force is action which one always possesses the natural right to take, and this includes the defense, the physical defense of someone's person. Their, their body against the act of violence. Force may be applied in that situation. When you are accosted with violence, you do reserve the right to use physical force defensively against such an assault. Violence, on the other hand, and this is the key to keep in mind with violence, it is the immoral initiation of physical power to coerce, compel, or restrain unrightfully. No one has the right to ever enact violence, because violence is always starting it. Initiation, that's the key word there. It's the immoral, the unrightful initiation. So, you know, teachers in schools will, you know, if there's a skirmish that happens between a couple of male students one day, they'll say, it doesn't matter who started it. All that matters is who started it. All that matters is who started it. All that matters. Because the person who actually conducted violence is the person who struck first. They initiated the immoral use of physical behavior, of physical force, to coer physical power to coerce, compel, or restrain. Therefore, when the person beats back that physical assault with force, they have not committed an additional wrongdoing. Okay? It's difficult for many people to understand who are in right brain imbalance. They don't want to acknowledge that you maintain the natural right to use force when you are accosted with violent behavior. If someone just came up to me on the street and started swinging, okay, because they want something I have or just because they don't like the look of me for whatever reason, they don't have the right to do that. If I replied by beating back their attack with sufficient force to put that action down, 
How many wrongdoings would have been committed? One. Correct. One. Not two. One. Because I maintain the right to defend myself with physical power, with physical force when necessary, when violence, meaning someone else, started the immoral behavior. That's what matters, the initiation. Who started it is all that matters. All that matters. And again, it's a very difficult thing for the ego to comprehend. The ego doesn't want to hear that. It's been conditioned so long that responding with force is also violence. We, we are verbally and mentally equating these two things. And when they, in fact, they are actual complete opposites. Okay, if somebody, if, if, if a kid got hit by somebody else in a school, and then that other kid said, maybe even said once, stop what you're doing. And then when the other kid wouldn't stop, he punched him and knocked him out. Okay? I would ask other people, who's, who, who struck first? And if the kid lying on the floor struck first, I'd say, you got what you deserved. That's it. Because that person had a right to defend themselves. You had no right to strike him. You initiated the violence. He responded with defensive force. Many people don't want to hear that. Natural law versus man's law or government. Here's the differences. Natural law is based upon the principles. It's based upon principles and truth. Meaning, things that are inherent to creation are not made by humankind. Natural law can only either be harmonized with due to knowledge and understanding or rejected due to ignorance. So it's not, it's not something that is based on compliance because of we fear the punishment that would result of not understanding it. Okay, if you don't understand it and live according to it, the result is inescapable because men and women are not actually creating the result. Okay? The universe is bringing that result to us intelligently and dynamically. All right? In other words, once again, this is about consequences. You behave a certain way, there's certain consequences. You change the behavior, you'll change the consequential results. Natural law is universal, which means that it exists and applies anywhere in the universe regardless of physical location. There is no place you can go in the physical universe to escape natural law. Let me know if you find a way out of this universe and into another where natural law no longer applies, and uh, you know we'll take a look at it together. But until you figure out the way out of this universe and into a place that's not governed by law, you're bound by natural law. Okay? Natural law is eternal. It, it will exist for as long as the universe exists, and it is immutable. It exists and applies for as long as the universe exists and cannot be changed by anything humanity is capable of doing or any other species in the universe is capable of doing for that matter. Man's law, on the other hand, let's look at how this contrasts with natural law. It's not based on principles and truth. It's based on dogmatic beliefs that are programs that are running in the human mind. These are constructs of the mind that operate like programs. Nat uh, man's law is complied with due to the fear of the punishment that will be conducted upon people who attempt to not comply with it. It's most of the only reason people ever comply with the law of man. And that's a very low state of consciousness, fear. That really is only going to get you all the negative things that we say we don't want if we're in that vibration. Man's law differs with location based upon the whim of legislators, like prohibition. Well, I'm allowed to smoke marijuana in one state, and then I could be jailed for it in another. My freedom could be taken if I cross this imaginary line. Hey, I'm, I'm a gun owner, okay? If I take one, if I take certain weapons that I own, Across an imaginary line, I could be jailed for years. But over this side of the imaginary line, it's okay. And you're just exercising a right. Hey, over here, it's morally wrong. We'll, we'll cage you for it. Over here, yeah, you're allowed to do that. You can have that high-capacity magazine. But over here, you're going into a cage for it. Just by crossing an imagine, imaginary barrier called a state border. And people think that makes sense. They think the moral relativism of man's law makes sense. They actually believe something can be moral in one place and immoral in another place. You know? That's cognitive dissonance. 
That's holding two contradictory notions in the mind simultaneously and accepting them both when they're clear contradictions with each other. It's called lying to yourself. Let's be honest about what it really is. It's called lying to yourself. Man's law changes with time based upon the whim of legislators, which is also moral relativism. Prohibition in the 1920s. Well, it was legal to possess and consume alcohol. Then for years it became illegal to do so. Then it switched back to becoming magically moral again. We won't cage you for doing it. Well, it changes over time based on our preferences and likes and dislikes. Yeah, we get to make up what law is, what right and wrong are. It's called moral relativism, all right? And it's one of the tenets of Satanism. So what does this mean for the law of man, actually? You know, the people seem to have so much respect for, you know? Oh, we're a nation of laws written by men, you know? We don't, we don't give a damn about moral law. We don't really give a damn about what's right and wrong, you know? But we have so much respect for the law of man, which we people actually believe is somehow based in morality when it's n nothing of the kind could be further from the, it's not you couldn't get any further from the truth than that it's based in moral relativism which is about the whims of the legislator at any given time or place you, know, you listen to certain forms of music in certain countries in the Middle East you could be jailed for years just by putting a certain song on imagine this no, and we would think that's unacceptable and deplorable. Yeah, we think, you have this 30-round magazine here. This state only allows 10 cartridges to go into a magazine. I bring the physical object, even if it's not loaded with any ammunition, into another state. I could be put in a cage. Physical piece of plastic. You know? It's just total nonsense. Either something is a right, and you're allowed to own it, and you, you need to be responsible for it, or it's not a right, because you're harming somebody. You know, it doesn't get any simpler than that. So what's this all mean for man's law? In light of natural law, what does it mean? To understand natural law, what does that mean for the laws of man here on earth? Well, what it actually means, it's simple if-then logic to apply. If a particular man-made law is in harmony with natural law, then it follows logically that it is redundant. It is stating the obvious. It is stating what is already known. It's like saying... I'm going to write down, yes, during the day, the sky uh, re uh, refracts a blue frequency. Uh, it, it, the sky is blue. I'm going to write that down and make it so. Well, it's redundant. It's self-evident. You can go out in the sky and look at the natural color of the sky on a clear day and, and see what the frequency is with your own eyes. No, you don't need to have it written down. Okay? It's a redundancy. It, so if it's in harmony already with natural law, it's stating a truth that is already there. It's an inherent truth. It's pre-existing. It's self-evident. Therefore, the writing down of that concept and calling it a law is irrelevant and unnecessary. Now, look, let's look at the opposite. What if something that man writes down as a law is in direct opposition to natural law? So if a particular man-made law is in opposition to natural law, it follows logically that it is both false, meaning that it is incorrect, Okay, that's what natural law is. It's based in truth, that which is. And it's also immoral. Because if it's not based in natural law, it means that it is doing something that is actually harming somebody by taking something from them that doesn't belong to you. Like taxation. Like permits and licensing. Like suspending rights that do already exist, etc. so forth. Alright? So, therefore, it's wrong. And it cannot be legitimately binding upon anyone. You can't write down a wrong and say, this is morally binding upon you, even though it, it, it creates harm, it causes harm, yet you must follow it. You know, and people believe this. We asked in the natural law seminar, how many people believe that if a law is passed and it restricts a right that you feel you have naturally because that action that, that it's saying you may not do causes no one else any harm. Do you have any moral obligation to obey that law until you could find a way to get it changed? And over two-thirds of people said, yes, you have a moral obligation to obey that law. Because these people are, are have the moral right to issue commands and write down laws that constrain you 
even if that behavior actually doesn't harm anybody and therefore is a natural right. You would still have to try to find a way to get that law changed. Nonsense. Nonsense. No one can be legitimately bound to a dictate of man that prevents somebody from exercising a natural right. It's called mind control, is what it's called. So in light of the differences between man's law and natural law, in light of natural law, man's law is both irrelevant and unnecessary, as it is either redundant because it is in harmony with natural law, or it is completely immoral because it is in direct opposition to natural law. Order followers, these are the people who keep this system of slavery in place. Okay, They're the people who keep this system of, sla in, of slavery in place. Let me just say this again. Order followers are the people who keep the existence of slavery in place. Not the ruling class, not the masters, not the so-called elite, which aren't the elite of anything but the bottom of a trash can. Okay? The people who keep slavery in place are the people who willfully follow their orders. Nobody wants to hear that. And people will hate you for saying it. Okay? If an individual, this is key to understand, if an individual is performing the task of following orders, by definition, that individual can not be exercising conscience. Since, by definition, exercising conscience means that one is willfully choosing through their free will for themselves right action over wrong action. So the, the concept of following orders is completely polar opposite to the concept of exercising conscience. You cannot be doing the same things simultaneously. It's impossible to do those two things simultaneously. They are contradictions in terms by definition. Okay, most people don't grasp that. Okay, by definition, if you're following orders, you cannot be actually exercising conscious, conscience, which involves free will choice based on the knowledge of right and wrong. Here's what order following gets us as far as a nation is concerned. You know, not that we're not already there, not that these people already didn't take us. Because we're taken by them already, covertly. They took us through the school systems. They, they couldn't beat us militarily. So they said, well, let's send our ideologues over there and get into the minds of their children. And if you don't believe that's what happened, you're very, very, very naive. Not only the Nazis, but the communists as well. Because really, it's all just forms of socialism. That's what feudalism is. Worldwide socialism is, there's no such thing as private property. State owns everything. Rights don't exist. Property rights don't exist. Everybody's a feudal serf again. It's called neo-feudalism. I don't care which branch you come at it from. You want to come at it from the left, that's called communism. You want to come at it from the right, that's called national socialism. Communism, international socialism. They're both the same force. It's called feudalism. Let's just call it what it is. It's called feudalism, which is in itself just another euphemism for slavery. They want neo-feudalism, which is the new world order of, of slavery. Okay? And it's already here. It's not something that's coming. It's here now. The object is to get out of it. This is the result of following orders. That's what following orders gets to society. Following orders should never be seen as a virtue. Following orders is evil. I don't care whether you're, I don't, I don't care if somebody, I don't care if somebody who is considered a holy man gives me an order and I'm, I follow it. I've just committed an act of evil. As far as I'm concerned. If I'm acting based on solely what somebody else has told me to do, that's evil. There's no morality in it at all. At all. At all. There's, it's not a virtue. It's evil. Okay? Let me just make that so abundantly clear and state it so unequivocally. There's no such thing as any possible moral following of orders. The two terms are contradictory. All right? 
I was just following orders is never a valid excuse or justification for immoral criminal behavior and this lame attempt to abdicate personal responsibility should never be accepted as a valid excuse for such behavior. And why it's done is through justification. And again, that means to create a right from jus, meaning right or law, and the Latin verb facere, which means to make or to create. And this is what they say, I was just following orders, I was just doing my job. I was shutting down your protest. You don't have a right to speak. The politicians commanded me so. So I just came out and I was just doing my job, hitting you with a sound cannon. You know, just doing my job, just following my orders. It's a justification. You're a criminal. There's nothing moral in that. There's nothing virtuous in that. It's called criminal behavior, criminal activity. And what they do is try to create it into a right, make it into a right by a justification. And nobody should ever accept their justifications. Because you know what their justifications is? That, you know what they are? It's called a 100% crock of bull that is a complete lie. It's a lie. They're just straight up looking you in the face and saying, I'm not responsible for that. I just did it, but I'm not the one who's responsible for it because I was acting on orders. Well, see, this defense didn't work as the Nuremberg defense, and nobody in America should be accepting it. Nobody in America should be accepting it because they believe in the legitimacy of authority and government through mind control. That's what the, they believe it. They believe there's legitimacy to it. Most people actually believe that there's legitimacy to this criminal behavior because a class of people calling themselves government have magically been imbued and gifted with such rights, quote unquote. They believe they have rights other people don't. They themselves believe it, but worse is that the people who are actually affected by that criminal behavior, they believe they have the authority to do it. Gandhi said, you assist an evil system most effectively by obeying its orders and decrees. An evil system never deserves such allegiance. Allegiance to it means partaking of the evil. A good person will resist an evil system with his or her whole soul, which means saying no. Moral culpability. What does this mean? The determination of who is ultimately at fault or deserving of blame. Again, this is a legitimate and real concept. There is fault. There is blame. We got to get over this new age nonsense that nobody's at fault, nobody's to blame. You should never say, hey, you shouldn't have done that. That caused a lot of chaos and trauma for other people. You're not to blame. It just happened. No, wrong. The people who did the behavior are to blame. Who carried out the Holocaust in Germany? The people who followed their orders to do it. That's who carried it out. Order followers is the answer. Who carried out the purge of political dissonance in Soviet Russia? Order followers. And they're always in the form of police. Why do you think they call a totalitarian system a police state? Why don't they call it a banker state? How come they don't call it a politician state? What about a lawyer state? How about a judge state? Why not call it any of those things? You want to know why? Because none of those people are ultimately responsible for bringing that condition into manifestation through their behavior. They're the order givers. The order followers carry out their commands and through their behavior make that con condition a reality. That's why it's called a police state. Because every police state ha that has ever existed has always been created by police who follow their orders because they don't want to take responsibility and think for themselves and know the difference between right and wrong for themselves like an adult. Instead, I want to be a child who obeys daddy, because I have daddy issues. All right, and that's what it's really about, folks. We're going to get to that. There is such a thing as blame for the commission of actions which have resulted in harm or loss to others. This is what culpable means. It comes from the Latin culpa, meaning fault or blame. It means at fault or deserving of blame. 
Now, who's more morally culpable, the order giver or the order follower? And please recognize I've underlined and capitalized the term more. I'm not telling you the order givers are not morally culpable. They are. That's not the question. Is, are, are any of these people morally culpable is not my question. My question is, look at the full question. Who is more morally culpable, the order giver or the order follower? Always. Always. At all times and places. At all times and places.